Okay, members, it's time for questions to the Minister of Education, and we will. Uh, we're just about to start with the list of questions. I now call Mr. John Stewart. I call the Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Education Authority has submitted an application on behalf of Carrick Fergus Academy under the recent call for major capital works. Uh, that call was issued in September of 2019 and it closed on the 31st of October of 2019. All the applications, this was a Northern Ireland wide call, so all applications submitted under this call are currently being considered by officials um, and applications which meet the eligibility criteria will be scored in accordance with the published protocol. As this is a live and ultimately competitive process between schools, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment further on a new build for Carrick Fergus Academy at this, site, at, um, at this time, but it's likely that a major capital announcement of schemes to advance in planning will be made in the forthcoming months. Mr Stewart, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Minister for his response. Um, I appreciate that there is an ongoing process. You understand that the uh, former schools of both Downshire and Carrick Fergus College were assured at the time when the concept of a merger was being discussed that they would be prioritised, and that was one of the concepts for which they undertook. So um, I look forward to hearing the outcomes. The parents, the pupils, the governors and the staff at Carrick Fergus Academy are very eager to see this happen. And can I ask him to do all he can to make sure that comes forward? Thank you. I'm always keen to help facilitate uh, capital build where I can. I think there's a good record of being able to have a flow of projects in relation to that. Uh, what I would say is, that most particularly if we're looking at uh, mergers, I think there's got to be a realisation as we move forward that there's given a level of priority, particularly where the mergers are taking place, or indeed there's a scheme which, which aids area planning. If we're to actually create, I suppose, a fairly joined up approach in terms of uh, our capital build, then Fueling and giving priority to area planning is going to be a critical element of that. Um, the member may be aware, just in terms of this particular case, uh, obviously the, the call that was issued and the criteria that was used in terms of the major capital preceded the restoration of, of um, the Assembly. So from that point of view, the officials, when they're making a, a level of scoring and judgment in relation to that, have got to bear in mind, if you like, the criteria that were there at that particular point. We can't sort of retrofect, if, if you like, uh, criteria on that basis. And it's important, therefore, that those schools that, that get past the gateway check of uh, eligibility in terms of the criteria um, would therefore then be judged and ranked on that. And from that point of view, the scoring criteria need to be applied fairly. I'll not seek to in any way interfere with that, that criteria. Uh, and hopefully, in different places, whenever we make the major capital announcement, there will be actually good news for a, a range of places. But I'm aware of the good work that's been going in Carrick Fergus to help facilitate this. I call David Hildage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and having been part of the consultation process, and including other stakeholders, parents, teachers, etc., a number of commitments were given by the department. When does the minister intend to, to give an updated position, or can the minister guarantee that the needs of Carrick Fergus Academy will indeed be met in the meantime? Well, I think from, from that point of view, as indicated in terms of major capital announcement, I hope to make that in the next few months now. Uh, I suppose where there's a wee bit more flexibility in terms of capital as opposed to resource side, because clearly the budget for next year has not been set, but capital projects tend to be multi-year in their, their nature, and there can be a little bit of flexibility of, of flow between those. So I'm hoping to make an overall major announcement in connection um, with all the, the applications relatively soon. But in terms of where we are in the meantime, Clearly, irrespective of whether there's a green light given to a capital build or new capital build for Carrick Fergus, uh, that doesn't negate uh, any applications against the, um, against the issue of uh, minor works. And as such, I suppose, uh, the laws over the last three years, um, there's about 74,000 has been spent directly on minor works on the junior and senior campus sites. Uh, and I think there's a, a further eight possible schemes for minor works that are being currently assessed on that basis. Um, I think under the last minor works, there's a total of 16 applications were uh, set down by Carrick Fergus and Downshire colleagues between them. Uh, as I said, there's work ongoing in relation to that. And so therefore, I think there's a realisation um, that even where we see particularly successful schools, there's also going to be a certain bridging period, particularly as regards minor works, because uh, with any capital announcement, it will by necessity even if it's successful, then take a number of years for that to happen. And we've got to ensure as much as possible and within the constraints of budget that all children, be they Carrick, Fergus or indeed anywhere else in Northern Ireland, are given the best possible conditions to study during that, that period. 
I call Paula Bradshaw. Mr. Speaker, um, does the Minister agree that all ability amalgamated schools like Carrickfergus Academy deserve the same high quality facilities as any other school? And therefore, will you please out, um, sorry, address how you are going to deal with the financial pressures in your department to ensure that there is capital investment across the province? Well, from that point of view, as, as indicated, uh, the position, first of all, I think that, that all schools are respective of the sector that they belong to. And indeed, um, wherever, if you like, the, parent, the, the pupils are driven from, need to be treated equally and given a, a fair opportunity. Uh, and as I indicated, I think that where we're seeing cases that are driven by area planning, and the area planning solution, I think that it, as, as we move ahead, I think those need to be given a level of prioritisation. Uh, in terms of the budget, obviously, as I said, uh, the slightly blank position of we don't know what next year's budget is going to be. However, uh, where there's a, there's a level of a little bit of flexibility, unlike some of the pressures that have been identified in terms of the resource budget, there is the opportunity with the um, because, for instance, if, if it was announced today at a particular school, that may be a number of years down the line before effectively the, the bricks and mortar are put on site. So there's a bit of flexibility that is born uh, in terms of exactly when things happen, uh, and indeed in terms of fitting around the budget. What I would say is, and I'll give a, a commitment. Uh, unless there's something that completely falls out of the sky, which limits the, the opportunity. When, certainly, if I'm in post, if I'm making an announcement in terms of future capital build, uh, I will make sure that that will happen. I think the only issue will be around uh, issues around timing. I'm not going to uh, give, if you like, false hope to particular schools. So I think it's important that schools, in terms of capital build, whether it's a major capital build, whether it's an SEP, or indeed commitment to specific minor works that they do so and can move forward with a level of confidence rather than any level of uncertainty. I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Question number two, Mr Speaker. Uh, I thank the member for his question. I know uh, he, along with others, indeed a number of the schools that we mentioned today, to obviously, uh, that the members have been very assiduous in, in pushing. Can I indicate in terms of the uh, in terms of Clifton School the Education Authority submitted an application under the second call of the School Enhancement Programme on behalf of, of Clifton School. Now, it was one of the schools that passed what's called the Gateway Check, so it is eligible in that regard. Um, and indeed, at that stage, across the board, there were a total of 165 applications uh, in terms of uh, the SEP. To date, the school has not been announced to advance in terms of planning. However, it remains on the prioritised special schools list. I should highlight as well that the schools list in terms of SEP was broken down into three categories, um, mainstream primary schools, uh, post-primary schools, and then a separate list of the special educational needs schools. Those prioritised lists remain live uh, to May 2020, and therefore there is a potential for a further final announcement before the list is closed. So the Education Authority, though, as well, will continue to undertake statutory capital works to the school through the Minor Works Programme. So it's not simply, if you like, whether it gets an SEP or it doesn't. And to alleviate the immediate accommodation pressure, the EA has recently uh, converted an unused home economics classroom into a general classroom. And they're also carrying out a survey and inventory of existing school meals accommodation to inform an assessment of the potential re refurbishment on that specific area. Mr. Don, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister will be fully aware of the challenges Clifton School have faced in recent years with increased numbers and the, need for, the real need for additional accommodation. The school was originally built for 120 children and now has over 170 pupils currently enrolled. I understand, as the Minister has said, the school has submitted an application for the SEP, the School Enhancement Programme, but will that application in any way hinder the the minor works programmes that are, are planned to take place? No, there's, again, um, with SEPs, there's a divergence between schools who apply for an SEP or schools that apply for a major capital new build. Uh, and as such, if, if you like, it's one of the two routes that they can take. And there's a divergence there. However, I would say that in terms of the SEP application, uh, any minor works, because it has already been assessed in terms of its position within the SEP works, so if there is for instance, minor works, and I've mentioned a couple of those already, uh, undertaken at the school. Um, that will in no way disadvantage the school as regards the, the school enhancement programme at present. It will be judged according to where it is on the list uh, at present. 
uh, you know, I'm also aware that the member has been very assiduous in pressing the issue of, of it, and I hope uh, in the near future to be able to visit um, Clifton Special School. Um, and I'm sure uh, they'll all be looking forward to that. Indeed. Thank you. I call Alan Chambers. Mr. Speaker, uh, Minister, uh, this is a, a relatively Clifton School is a relatively new build. Uh, can I ask, did the department underestimate the accommodation needs uh, for this school when the original plans were submitted? I would say to the member, I'm not privy to what the original plans were, but what we have seen within special needs education, uh, we've seen various changes over the years in terms of, particularly as regards school numbers. Uh, I think at times, while there's been, for instance, a desire uh, to have as many special needs uh, children educated within the mainstream, uh, I think one of the very positive things that we have seen uh, in terms of special needs is, first of all, greater diagnosis of special needs, and secondly, I think as years have gone by, uh, there have been a much greater ability and involvement of special needs, education, of special needs children within education. So there would be some children, and I know um, sometimes those who go to, to Clifton, for instance, uh, will be sometimes at the, the very sort of high end, if you like, of, of dependency in terms of special needs. I suppose if you look back many years, some of those children, sadly, would not even have survived to the age that they are today. And I think that's something we should all be thankful for on that, on that basis. But uh, with the increased identification, it has led to an increase in terms of the numbers that are there. The school estate has got to keep pace with that. And I suppose one of the challenges, while Clifton is one of the more recently built, historically speaking, uh, special educational needs schools, obviously in terms of where the prioritisation also lies, there will be a number of schools, for instance, in Belfast, that are uh, date back many, many years in terms of their accommodation. The important thing is we move ahead in terms of special needs is as much as possible that we have... Um, for those particularly vulnerable children, that the best possible facilities that can be provided, which I think all of us would share in that, in that goal. Okay, moving on to Mr. William Irwin. Question number three, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Member, for his question. Hardy Memorial Primary School is not currently listed for significant capital investment. And obviously, uh, in order for any school to obtain that, that capital uh, investment, needs to be selected for a call for either a school enhancement programme, which I've been referring to, or major capital uh, projects. The most recent call for major capital projects, as I indicated, uh, started in September uh, 2019 and then closed on the 31st of October 2019. The Schools Management Authority, the Education Authority, did not put the school forward um, under that. It is, for the, at first instance, for the Education Authority, as the Schools Management Authority, to decide if Hardy Memorial meets the criteria for major works, and if so, forward the proposal to the Department for consideration in a, in a future announcement. Thank the Minister for his response. And, uh, can the Minister tell me what steps does the school need to take to be able to be considered for capital development? I think very specifically, um, and I know that um, Hardy Memorial falls into this category, there are a number of schools um, and as it would be potentially subject to a development proposal, maybe limited in what I can directly say, but generically there are a number of schools across Northern Ireland um, that, in terms of particularly their enrolment figures and their admissions, while they can be very healthy, perhaps reflect a particular historic situation, sometimes a particular set of circumstances which didn't actually take place. I think it is important uh, that schools that find themselves in this position because they can then find almost an artificial barrier, which is that if they are failing to, or unable, if you like, to have the amount of enrolment of a gap then of about 15% between that and what, they, uh, what they're entitled to do, can then find themselves running against the barrier of the gateway check, which therefore means that they don't count as a sustainable school. I think it is uh, for a range of schools that, that find themselves on that basis uh, to see if um, with working with the management authority, they can put in, submit a development proposal which allows a level of right sizing. Uh, because again, I know even from previous experience, simply as an MLA, on a number of occasions where schools have maybe had an unrealistic figure which reflected something a decision taken in the 1970s or the 1980s. And it's important that schools are not artificially held back from doing that. 
Uh, and obviously then it would be for Hardy to engage with the Education Authority on that issue of, of right sizing. At the moment, because of the way the numbers work, there is a certain level of barrier towards uh, the school. I call Ms. Paula Bradley. Okay, Mr. Speaker, question four. I thank the member for uh, her question. The Education Authority is, is engaged in phase one of a small business research um, initiative procurement process which includes the development and introduction of an electronic system of record keeping for special educational needs assessments. The phase of this process is due for completion on the 31st of March of 2020. The objectives of the process are to improve efficiency and effectiveness in the use of data, to provide a child-centric, and I think we should all remember, we, in education and other fields, we can talk about uh, vast statistics out there, but actually behind, for instance, any decision on special needs education, as indeed in others, we're talking about individual children, so it has to be child-centric. That, that will provide insight-driven service for parents, carers, and young people with SEN. Uh, key metrics of the process will be expected to include reduced time for statutory assessment, reduced costs for, of administration of those statutory assessment, improvement in the experience of the assessment and review process for parents and service users, and there has been at times considerable concerns have been raised, particularly by parents. Improvement in the quality and time, uh, timeliness of information for service providers, uh, advanced analytics and electronic system of record keeping. Paula Bradley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his answer thus far and welcome his answer. I have spoken to several Senkos in schools in my own area who have highlighted um, the amount of duplication and the amount of paperwork required during an educational pathway of a child. Just to further on from that, can I ask the Minister what work is being done to share information um, between the Education Authority and the Health Trust um, during the statutory assessment process? Well, the Member is right, and I think across the board, I think there is a desire to look particularly both, and it's perhaps most acute in terms of uh, special needs education, but across the board, where there's um, unnecessary duplication, and sometimes it can be between different sort of statutory bodies, sometimes it can be within education or across education and other bits, I think we need to look at how we can roll back and ensure that there is almost a separate issue of how the burden can be reduced both on parents and on schools. But very specifically in terms of the issues regarding health trust, uh, Led by my department, there is an implementation of improvements through the Joint Education and Health Notification Referral and Statutory um, Assessment NRSA project, which is nearing completion. Uh, and many of the key recommendations have been implemented. For example, revised standard templates for use by the health trusts to record information needed for statutory assessment. Uh, and the EA and the health trusts are currently testing a mechanism to securely transfer information, because we live obviously in an era of GDPR and indeed the protection of data between both uh, organisations um, electronically. Call Chris Little. Mr. Speaker, the Education Minister will be aware that serious concerns for the Education Authority administration of special educational needs led to an internal audit. Does the Minister believe this is an adequate approach to investigating these concerns, and can he update the Assembly on this review? Well, I understand I'm, I'm, the audit is, has reached the completion point. I think it will be shared, first of all, I think, with the Education Authority Board. I hope to receive that fairly soon. I think it's important that actually, in terms of processes, it's actually about getting this, this right. And while much of that is actually directly for the EA to implement, as a department, as a minister, I'm wanting to make sure that all provisions are made and lessons are learned uh, for our special needs uh, children and particularly for, also for their parents as well. Because I think what we were left with, and I think all of us as um, individual MLAs will have, will have had levels of frustration that are there, uh, both from individual parents and throughout our constituencies. I think it's important that whatever the audit comes back with, that if there are key recommendations, that those are implemented, implemented swiftly, so that we're not faced, particularly when it comes to, um, for example, placement of children in terms of special educational needs, that we don't have another summer where there's these difficulties where records appear to be lost. Um, where there is inadequate communication, uh, because it is particularly, I suppose, particularly when a child is looking for, uh, and a family is looking where their child is going to get placed in terms of special education needs, it is a high, time of high stress. So it's both, if you like, about getting the substance, but also ensuring that the communication strategy is right in terms of doing that as, as well. I call Karen Mullen. 
Chancola, uh, to ask the Minister, given the concerns raised and sensitive information about children recorded in special education needs, needs assessments, how will he ensure any introduction of electronic record keeping will be compliant with data protection safeguards? Look, the, the member raised a very uh, important point, uh, and that's why I think in terms of the work that's ongoing between the EA and the health trusts to effectively trial this out to ensure that what they've got is fit for purpose, it's got to be on the basis that the information is, is secure. Uh, and so there's a, a, currently I think both the EA and the health trusts are testing the secure sending of this before it goes live on that basis. Uh, all documents used to collate and share information relating to statutory assessment have also been amended to include um, explicit parental consent, because again, there's no point in going ahead uh, with sh any sharing of information unless it's with the buy-in of parents uh, and ensure that they are GDPR compliant. I think while that will be a choice in terms of the explicit parental consent for the individual parents, given that, if you like, the process will mean that there's a better sharing of data, hopefully a more timely process, a more efficient process and a better process, I would certainly uh, once the, the testing has been done of that in terms of GDPR, I would certainly urge parents to give that parental consent, but that is obviously a, a choice also for each individual parent. Call Mark Durkin. I thank the, the Minister for his answers thus far. I welcome news of this new electronic system, which sounds like it will increase the speed uh, with which assessments are carried out. Will the system have, however, more agility or flexibility than the current system? So that uh, children can get, or, or, as children's needs change, so does the support that they receive without having to go right back to the start again. I think, obviously, in terms of any digital system, and I think to be fair to the Education Authority, um, they have introduced, I think, in recent days, a couple of digital systems, which, in terms of trialling, has actually worked out uh, quite well. Um, and so, for instance, the, the check, for instance, in terms of eligibility on transport, was something which, which. Uh, worked very well in, in relation to that. Uh, yeah, I think it is important that there is that level of agility. The agility, if we're talking about digital system, is largely about the transfer of information. So from that point of view, the information can, can transfer, but it's important uh, that we have a wider um, level of support and protection for uh, special needs ed education. And so, for example, this will also feed in, we're hoping to uh, consult in the spring uh, with the, the new framework in terms of SEN. So it's important that we have a thing that is adaptability. I think one of the problems that has perhaps been there in the past has been that a particular assessment is done of a child and then it becomes effectively a fixed point. Uh, which now, that in one sense sometimes gives assurance to people, but it can also mean that what we have is not up to date with what is, is required. I think the flow of secure information hopefully can make the system uh, a little bit more agile. It certainly can't hurt uh, in that, on that basis. And I think hopefully that will also mean that we could look at, in terms of special education needs, how, how there can be um, maybe more tailored interventions and indeed perhaps earlier interventions, rather than to some extent in the past there's maybe been a little bit too much of a one-size-fits-all type approach. I call John O'Dowd. I call you question number five. Yes. I'm wondering how quickly it would be that uh, academic selection would, would come in. And I suppose while well, there's been much controversy over uh, issues around language in the last, last month, the, uh, uh, perhaps at the date risk of introducing a fourth language into the equation, uh, there's a little bit of plus ça change, plus ça même shows from the, from the member. Can I say, I suppose, in specific reference to the, um, the report, uh, sorry, I should probably for the benefit, as nobody has earphones, say that the more things change, the more they stay the same, uh, translate that. Can I say while the, the report has not been formally submitted uh, to the department, the findings will be considered. Now, I note the report talks about further research in order to develop bespoke solutions. And I think this underlines the commitment uh, within New Decade New Approach to establish an expert group to establish the link uh, between education underachievement and socioeconomic background. And it's a vital opportunity um, to explore that. On the issue of, of academic selection, you know, the member will be aware there is a range, wide range of views, and maybe that uh, both myself and the member do not have quite a simpatico view on the, the benefits or otherwise of uh, academic selection. I support the right of schools to select on the basis of academic selection. And I think that our system has got to be ensured that it has opportunities for all. 
And I think if we're looking at the issue of education under achievement, um, I think one of the problems is that sometimes there has been too much of a focus at what happens precisely at 11. And critically, if we were to actually make the big differences in terms of education under achievement, uh, a lot of the focus, and I know to be fair to him and predecessors, uh, this is something that has been realised for many years and has been implemented for many years. It's about those early interventions as well, which are the critical bit, because to some extent, if there is a problem still persisting at age 11, uh, then there's a good argument that we haven't really sorted out the problem on that basis. But I, I look, to, look forward to many um, fine engagements with the, the, the member office in his now elevated role as, as chief whip of the, of, uh, the party opposite. John, I, um, I thank the member for his, or for the minister for his response, and even I, without my 11 plus, understood what he said at the start. Um, the, the question, or my question, is this: I have no doubt that the minister believes in evidence-based policy. I mean, all the evidence points in one direction. Then I think there is a responsibility on ministers across the board to make the right decision. And when the United Nations, on the Committee on the Rights of the Child, the Equality Commission, the Human Rights Commission the four teachers' trade unions, PISA, and many other international research all tells us that 11, the 11 plus and academic selection is bad for your education system, then I think there's a duty on the minister to follow that evidence. And what do you agree that it's time to bring it to an end? I, I could um, hurry up other questions by simply saying no in relation to that. But look, it, in my experience, I think on the issue of academic selection, there's been a, an argument which both in this jurisdiction and indeed across other jurisdictions have arguably been, been raging for 50 or 60 years. It's unlikely to be a, a level of consensus on it. I, look, I would take a view in terms of academic selection that if you compare it with what is the likely alternative and you look, for instance, to what happens across the water in England, where there is a system of public schools, we call it sort of private education, where those who are wealthiest are able to effectively buy the best education. Those who see schools that, that, will provide, um, uh, that will provide a particular set of education and actually judge by distance where the, the house prices go up at the possibly best schools on that basis, will see that the alternative is actually selection by wealth. And I believe at least whatever the flaws are there within academic selection, they are not one that will actually, by comparison, across the water drives, I think, a much more unequal society. If we look at social mobility, uh, we see in terms of the intake, in terms of our universities, we have a much more diverse level of social mobility than in other places. We have seen a steady rise in terms of the success rate of those, for instance, on, on free school meals. We have a system where I think last year, uh, for non-selective schools, they outperformed the average um, in Wales, and indeed, in terms, of, in terms of that, is ahead of the OECD average. So I think. Uh, while there could be criticisms made of our current system, I think there's a lot to be celebrated in terms of the success as well. And if we simply brew, uh, view the prism of education under achievement through the issues of academic selection, then I think we've, we've missed a trick. Call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, Minister, in 2016, not long before this place fell, you took the unilateral decision to um, reintroduce coaching, um, transfer test coaching to primary schools. Can you provide an estimate to how much primary school teaching time has been spent on transfer test coaching in the past three and a half years? I, I appreciate the member is somewhat new to this place. He may find actually my decision was effectively the reverse. What was happening was that there was guidance was issued by the de department uh, to schools, essentially saying you are not to do anything which prepares up. What was happening in that was it became a certain level of um, false prospectus in that some schools were providing it, but not letting perhaps the Department of Education know about some were actually abiding by that. What I actually said was I was leaving it up to the schools to decide themselves. And he mentions about coaching. Where there's a ban in place on doing any level of preparation within schools, coaching will happen, but it will again be those who are in the best position financially to be able to afford it who are getting that, that coaching. This was actually to try to produce, a, a certain extent, a, a greater level playing field. And it was also on the basis that whatever was happening, it was not to be to the detriment of the curriculum that was being provided in, in primary yeah, schools. Kelly Armstrong for a very quick question and hopefully from the Minister a very quick response. It will be very quick. Thank you very much for your um, patience, Mr Speaker. Um, can I ask the, the Minister for Education, there's a, a, a growing, increasing growing uh, body of evidence that's against academic selection. Can you cite any specific independent research in favour of the suitability of academic selection? 
by the pragmatic success story that our schools have been, that we have continually, at post-primary level at GCSE, achieved the highest results in Northern Ireland. We have less than 1% of our pupils in terms of GCSE leaving without any qualifications at all. We have seen that in terms of the results, we have seen a steady improvement in terms of free school meals, where indeed the gap is closing. And as I indicated, we're, we're for even non-selective schools uh, within our system, the results are higher than the OECD average and also, for instance, higher than the average for Wales. So actually, the proof of the pudding is very much in the eating. And the reality is, we are not living in some utopian uh, type system where by abolishing this, and I note obviously the member therefore wants to see the abolition of grammar schools clearly uh, in relation to this. But if we were to do so, what's oh, sorry? Emma's up. Well, it would be an effective thing, but I appreciate obviously the speaker has. Hold on, please. That ends the period for a list of questions. We'll now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Cahill Boylan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Minister said in last week in a debate on autism and teacher, uh, teacher and classroom training, and there was, uh, a motion was supported by all sides of the House. I just wonder, um, in light of that debate, would the Minister consider entering into discussions with unions? And what's his opinion on Gormian Market? There, there may be, an, uh, without in any way entering at a certain level of turf war, I think perhaps one of the things, because there does seem to be uh, a little bit of a divergence of the particular positions of the unions, it may be useful because it seemed to be, I know, that NASUWT and UTU seem to come from quite a, quite a different position. Look, I'll be working with all stakeholders to try to ensure them, that we can implement the best possible provision in terms of autism training. It's important to think that. that um, that as much as possible, if we can get the teaching profession speaking with one voice, I think that is, that is helpful as well. And obviously the challenges are there is how we best put this in place, both in terms of initial teacher education, but also in terms of rolling that forward, given some of the expertise that is out there in terms of the teaching workforce at present, so that we can ensure that all our pupils get the best possible uh, level of provision um, for and indeed awareness of, of autism in particular. Thank the Minister for the answer. And, and following on from that, Minister, and I appreciate the positions of some of the unions, would the Minister then uh, seek funding for any scheme that he would seek to uh, introduce in the future? I, I'm always keen to seek any form of funding, and if the member opposite can have a word with, the, uh, with his constituency colleague uh, for Nuri uh, Armagh, the Finance Minister, I would greatly appreciate any assistance that, that can be done. I, I think it's important as well. I think there's opportunities because as we move towards an SEM framework, that will also involve a level of training of, of teachers. That will carry a level of, of price tag along with it. And I think we can create something that is integrated uh, within that. Now, uh, I mentioned, I think, at last week's debate, there will also be work needed to be done in terms of initial teacher education. Uh, that will require, if you like, cooperation not just of, of the department, but also then with the Department of Economy and also the teacher training institutions. Because uh, from that point of view, while uh, the department sets the numbers and can give levels of direction uh, to those, the details of the curriculum are ultimately uh, will be done in conjunction then with those teacher training bodies. And ultimately, those additional costs will be probably borne uh, by uh, the Department of the Economy. So certainly, I think that if we're going to do something, it can't be something that's done simply on a shoestring. It's got to be something which uh, is fit for purpose. Uh, and any additional resources my department can get, I am very keen to announce. I think, as I said uh, to one of the members last week, the one thing you can pretty much be sure of within education, if there's money there, it will get spent. John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you. I'm sorely tempted to return to the subject of academic selection, but there's another matter I wish to raise with the Minister. And I have no doubt I'll return to that other subject again. Uh, and it's in relation to money. Uh, will, will the Minister be engaging with the Peace Plus programme in relation to shared education and other programmes that are funded uh, in the Department of Education through various EU peace programmes in the time ahead? Look, I'm, I'm happy to engage with any particular programme. In terms of the shared education, I think there can be a great value within that, as with indeed uh, other activities. And as such, I think that there will be opportunities moving ahead, uh, I think despite Brexit, uh, where there can be that level of, of cooperation. I think it's also the case that if we're looking at, at uh, some wider context, whenever we have the, um, whenever a, a new government emerges in the Republic of Ireland, there will also be certain things that, in terms of uh, cross-border aspects to this, we need to look at as well. And I'm certainly very open-minded to 
try and engage in any shape or form where we can actually uh, build, if you like, on those experiences. And again, if there's any routes in which additional funding can be levered in, uh, again, I'm very open to that as well. Uh, Thank you, Kenko. The, the Minister has to be concerned that given the significant amounts of money, and, and I doubt if he has the figure in front of him, he could supply it at another time, but the significant amounts of money that do come from EU funding programmes in the Department of Education, which we are about to lose at some stage going into the future, uh, has he factored in how he's going to replace those or how the Department is going to operate without those costs? I think look, if we're in a wider position, I think, to be fair, and I'm sure we can get the detail of the exact amounts that are there. Um, to be fair, in terms of the direct input of those funds into the Department of Education, we would tend to be uh, one of the departments that would be um, in the lower scale compared to some other departments in relation to that. Obviously, there will be engagement uh, both with the executive as a whole and indeed uh, the wider UK government in terms of where we can find additional funding, where there can be, if you like, replacement funding. And obviously, one of the bonuses of, of Brexit will be the opportunity uh, within the Northern Ireland Executive to receive additional funds that perhaps otherwise would have gone to the EU. And we've got to make sure that those are spent in uh, as appropriate a manner as possible. Call Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Minister, last year the three main teacher unions gave a presentation to the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, at which they said few educationists would disagree that our system has an enormous body of staff who do little more than checking or regulating other staff other words, uh, micromanaging. So, Minister, have you any plans to review the overall administration of our schools and put more money into frontline teaching? Well, look, certainly there's a priority to ensure that that is what is there in frontline teaching. I think, um, to be fair, and I think wherever there can be efficiencies, and part of the bid we, uh, is put in for next year, as indeed for this year, will be around particularly uh, voluntary redundancies where they can happen in terms of administration. Look, there's a priority of whatever level of budget has got that the maximum amount is put into uh, frontline services. What I would say is, um, and perhaps rightly so, a majority of, majority of the money that is within the Department of Education goes directly into teacher salaries. The clear majority goes directly into schools. So to some extent, I think, while there are efficiencies that can be driven from the system, and indeed, I think it's one of the aspects that will also need to be looked at in terms of the wider review of, of education, I am not convinced that there is a large pool of money which simply, if, if it was easy to be drawn down, I think it would have been done uh, by now. But certainly, where any place there can be efficiencies uh, can be drawn, because roughly speaking, about 80% of the overall cost of education will be directly on salaries. Where that can be directed as much as possible to frontline services, I'll, I'll be taking that. And sometimes that will mean difficult decisions need to be taken. Lois Kelly, supplementary. Uh, can I ask the Minister if he will th then consider the, the fact uh, that the, um, the classroom sizes are the highest across these islands, I believe, and what measures he can introduce through that review to address this? Well, sizes um, on that, that basis in terms of things. It, it, it depends a little bit. I think I've seen some statistics. At times, I'm not actually sure they're particularly accurate. And I suppose with any set of statistics, you can question the variable base uh, within that. Look, I can only reiterate that I will try to ensure that, uh, from that point of view, that um, as much as possible, frontline services are delivered within that. One of the issues probably we have in terms of classroom sizes is a high variability within our system. Um, and that is particularly sometimes where we are seeing, um, which I think is not a particularly good thing, where we're seeing sort of multi-year uh, being taught now by the one teacher across that particularly in primary school, or indeed in terms of um, post-primary school, where the, the range of subjects can't be provided, and that's part of a wider reform agenda. What that will mean at times, it will also then lead a, a driver to ensure that we get the best possible results for our children. Sometimes that can lead to certain levels of efficiencies, but efficiencies don't come with simply an, an easy button to press in relation to that. That will require a level of change, and that will be a challenge, I suspect, to all of us across the House. Uh, Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Education will be aware of the significant impact of ongoing teacher industrial action and the new decade, new approach commitment to urgently resolve this matter. Can I ask him, therefore, how he is working with the Minister of Finance and the UK Government to secure the finance necessary to implement fair teacher pay and conditions as agreed in June 2019? I'm tempted to say if this was pantomime season, the, the 
Uh, the genius just appeared from a, a, across the chamber in terms of the Minister of Finance. Look, I'd be working with both the Minister of Finance and uh, the rest of the part and the rest of the executive as part of the broader budgetary process. I think, in conjunction with other departments, um, there'll be the opportunity. I think, roughly speaking, in a week's time, to meet directly on a one-to-one -one basis with the Minister of Finance. I, I have met in terms of the. Um, and it's right to mention both pay and also conditions, because, again, sometimes there's a pure focus on one without the other. I have met with the, the unions at a very good meeting with the unions um, since I've been in office. I've indicated that I think as regards agreement, at least on the 17 to 19 phase, there is largely something which, um, to borrow from our Prime Minister, is effectively oven ready. Um, all we need then is the direct finance to do that. And I've indicated to them that if the sufficient finance is there, I will move on that very quickly. I think it's important that we can get a level of industrial harmony. Arising out of that will also be a range of work streams looking at conditions. And I think there are opportunities to have win-wins on those. I think issues around administration, around inspection, around substitution, etc. I think there are changes which need to be made there. Um, I'd be looking, I think, as well to see while not prejudicing anything within the work streams, is how quickly we can move ahead uh, with those things. Because the sooner, if there's something good can be done, the quicker it's done, I think the better. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his update. How confident is he that he will secure the finance necessary to secure fair teacher paying conditions? And is there any threat of an escalation of industrial action if indeed he does not secure that finance urgently? Uh, I don't want to overhype things. I think if we're in a situation where either things are resolved, I think that that produces a, a positive way forward. If they're not resolved, I think there's always the risk of a, a level of escalation. So I think he's right to sort of highlight that. I suppose in terms of how confident I am in terms of securing the resources, uh, that may be a question which is maybe better directed to uh, the, member, the minister opposite. Dagla Magalier. Dagla uh, could the Minister uh, tell us, has the Department any plans um, to ensure that schools in rural areas will benefit from improved broadband connectivity with the rollout of project stratum? Well, the direct detail in terms of the broadband strategy, and I think schools can benefit from that, ultimately that is something being driven by the Department of the Economy. Uh, and indeed, it is important that promises that were made in terms of the level of investment in terms of infrastructure on, on uh, broadband are delivered upon by, uh, by government centrally. Uh, in terms of the detail of the rollout, again, as I said, it is really a matter directly for uh, a different department. But I think if you are getting improved rural broadband, that will have, I think, very positive impacts um, on our schools. And I have seen, for instance, um, we are quite often in terms of some of the digital skills that are used there, in terms of some of the use of good broadband. You know, I have visited schools where I have seen very intelligently used uh, techniques, for instance, in terms of teaching, which can make use of, of the electronic uh, devices on, on that basis. Supplementary, Dagla Magalier. I am going to thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister give us insurance that he will uh, consult with his colleagues in the Department of Economy in regards to Project Stratum, and also give an assurance that the Education Authority will be sufficiently funded so that schools uh, will be well placed? Uh, with additional IT resources to deal with the hopefully anticipated uh, improved connectivity? Well, look, I think, as I said, as con uh, connectivity, I think we need to make sure that we are well placed in relation to that. It is, as with a number of issues, and you can touch on uh, issues around, say, the 14 to 19 strategy, where we'll be looking to work with uh, the Department of Economy, or issues around early interventions, which then sometimes are cross cutting between health uh, and even justice or communities. Or indeed issues around mental health issues within schools. You know, there's a lot of this requires a level of joined up thinking and joined up work. And uh, certainly as regards the broadband issue, I'll be very happy to be working uh, with my colleague indeed with other departments to help deliver that. I call Ms. Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the Minister of Education amend Schedule 3, Subsection 3 of the Addressing Bullying in Schools Act, Northern Ireland 2016, to reflect Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 and ensure that schools report bullying across all Section 75 groups? It is important that any bullying incident from whatever source it comes, uh, and I think whenever I think it was the previous Minister brought in the legislation in terms of anti bullying legislation. Um, I was chair of the committee at that stage, and I think it was important that, that all incidents are, are recorded. 
you know, from that point of view, and indeed, I think reference is made, and clearly, perhaps the, the members, the, the legislation to hand in that regard. But mention was made in the legislation uh, that essentially both the incident would be recorded and also what the nature, indeed, and the cause of the particular element of, of bullying. You know, my view on it is bullying is wrong no matter what source that it comes. Now, uh, I think the next step, and I suppose before we look directly at any forms of amending of legislation, um, has been that there will be consultation soon on how we actually implement um, the legislation itself. There's been guidelines, I think, been drawn up by the Northern Ireland Anti-Bullying Forum. Uh, those are in a position, I think, fairly quickly to be, to be rolled out. Uh, there has been, I think, some level of problems in terms of rolling out the uh, training on that, and to some extent it has maybe in some schools been a little bit of a, uh, a byproduct sometimes of the industrial action side of things. I, I think alongside a desire to ensure then that industrial action is brought to an end, that we get the requisite training for all our teachers in terms of preventing bullying, because from whatever source, whatever motivation, whatever false prospectus that anybody is using for bullying, whether it's in a school or outside a school, is wrong. And I think it's a very clear-cut message. And we heard that, uh, I think, across the chamber, but also particularly from our young people at the, uh, the event on Friday. Unfortunately, the time is up. We move on to questions to the Minister of Finance. And I call Mr William Irwin. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Uh, the detail around the situation with vehicle testing is a matter for the infrastructure.